can't figure out where to put this. Because we need to see the clock. Yeah. You're going to put your phone there so I can touch it too. <clears throat> so uh, the, the first thing I want to say today is um, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome, welcome here. here. So last week, um, I began by saying that instead of simply uh, going out on a limb in my teaching, I was going out on a leaf on that limb, and even on the edge of the leaf on that limb, and that I wanted to have a way for you to participate by making questions and comments about the teachings that you have been hearing from me over a while. I know that um, some of what you hear in here is a little bit at variance from what you may have been taught by the church. <laughs> and um, so I, I wanted your comments and your, your questions. And um, we're going to continue that today. I asked Callista if it would be a good idea to do, and she said, you can never do things too much. So John and somebody are going to pass out pens and cards and you can write your questions over a period of time today and comment. You were very generous in, in your comments from last week. And um, I want to thank you about that. Your, your questions were very thoughtful and uh, reflected that you're paying attention. <laughs> and that also, um, and I think your being here shows that you're benefiting in the direction, benefiting from the direction that we have been going. So we got the questions last week, and Holly took them home and read every one of them, read all the comments, and then she and I probably, well, we spent three hours together this week and then a lot of time collaborating on this class online, which I didn't know how to do. Now but you do. I do know how yeah. to do that. <laughs> and so um, I want to tell you the categories that your questions and comments fell into, and we are going to co-teach today, not dialogue. We're going to co-teach about these, and if we have a chance to do some dialogue and Q&A, we're going to do that. Um, um, <laughs> clearly, we're not going to cover all of these thoroughly, <laughs> uh, because the first one is God. <laughs> so, uh, Can we agree to skip that one? Huh? Didn't we agree to skip that one? No. Uh, no. <laughs> Holly's, Holly's uh, going to God. Uh, the other categories were uh, politics. Yeah. We have a lot on politics and, and meaning uh, what um, even John Howard asked today. Where's the prophetic voice? Yeah in the church today about what's going on in our in our society. I'm going to handle that one. Yes. And then we're going to do uh, spiritual practice. These are actually out of order. Uh, and then the, the problem of suffering. We're being... <laughs> <laughs> Just small things. Small little things. Today. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, the title of this time today is um, Opening Our Hearts and Minds With and By Compassion. And uh, we thought that we would show a parable to get us started. So uh, do we need to get out of the way? We do. So you're going to walk over there. I'll walk over here. Okay. Uh, and I can, I'll tell you right now that the... Um, uh, uploading this video that you're about to see to the Ordinary Life website or, or won't work because it's too big, but I'll put a link in the summary that goes out. So Tim's going to get the lights, and um, do we need to get these? Tom, can you get these lights? Yes. Okay. All of the doctors and medical people in the room are going to go crazy, but uh, this is worth it. There's no sound.
<laughs> I'm glad I saw that before, or I would be up here a mess. <laughs> Tim needs us a little closer. Yeah. Okay, we good? Thanks. Okay. okay. Um, so actually my favorite woman philosopher talks about horses as being a really highly evolved animal when she talks about how everything kind of evolves into the highest level of spirit. So I think it's kind of cool that that was a horse. Before you talk mm -hmm. about, no, I'm not on. Okay, before you talk about God, can I show some cartoons? Yes, please. <laughs> God saying, not too short or people won't know I'm God. I just wish they didn't seem so disappointed when they finally meet me. That's funny. <laughs> Ready? I'm, I'm gone. All right. Um, so I talked last time about um, kind of needing a bigger imagination about God. And if we can expand our imaginations about God, perhaps that our language can also expand. Um, and over the holidays, <laughs> I had a kind of miracle experience. Um, I didn't see Jesus on toast, and I, <laughs> nor did I, uh, yeah, <laughs> disappointing. Um, <laughs> but, but a lot of things came together which kind of made me think, this is, this is God. And I came up with a new name for God. You can kind of work on that. Um, on Thursday, December 27th, my family of five was supposed to travel to Costa Rica. And we got there. Josh loves to get there about two and a half hours in advance, and we did. And um, we go to check in, and I wasn't able to check in because the, my renewed passport, which had just been renewed over the summer, spelled my name wrong. You know, you send in your old one. And they send you a new one. And I looked at it, and I put it in the drawer, and I never thought about it again until December 27th when we were supposed to travel. Um, so this is about 2.30 in the afternoon, five days into a government shutdown, and, um, <laughs> and my family's leaving at 4 o'clock. So the ticket agent would not let me check in. Um, I let a lot of very choice words fly. Um, I wasn't mean to anyone. I just... Cut. A lot. A lot. <laughs> I did not teach any children how to pray that day. Um, <laughs> uh, I just, yeah, it was, it was, it was bad. Um, <laughs> but I, and anyways, the, the point is that my family goes on, checks in, and I'm thinking I'm not going at this point. So um, I get online, I start looking at when do passport agencies close, the passport agency in Houston, everyone tells me the only thing you can do is go to the passport agency tomorrow morning and see what they can do for you. Um, it's 2.30 by now after I've had a few emotions. Um, and I decided I'm just going to go. I'm going to go to the passport office and I call an Uber and race over to Terminal E. My Uber arrives and it's about 2.30 by now. The passport office closes at 3. Where is the passport office? Downtown, oh. 1919 Smith Street, just in case you need to know. Um, <laughs> Carlos picks me up in his Uber, and um, he's kind of, I'm freaking out in English and, you know, frantic. And he is just kind of nodding and smiling in the rear view mirror. Mir I can't say that word. Rear view mirror. And um, suddenly I clue in. He's not understanding what I'm saying. And I say, do you speak Spanish? And he's like, yes, yes. So I start speaking in Spanish to him. I need you to get to the passport office as quickly as possible. He swerves through traffic. He gets me there literally at 2.59. Um, I jump out of the car. I fly through this security, and I hear this voice, Holly, in the background. I'm like, somebody who hasn't seen me in 20 years doesn't need to see me now. Um, <laughs> keep going. But it was Sela who lives with us. So my first um, name for God is Carlos. <laughs> um, Sela runs in and says, I'll take her backpack. I'll help her out. Somehow they let her take my stuff through security. You know that doesn't happen, right? In government agencies, you have to like strip down. But she comes in, takes my stuff. I fly up to the fourth floor, and they're closing. They're about, they're, all the guards are standing there, and I just say, who wants to help me? Who wants to be my superhero today? And, um, <laughs> and I sort of explain the story, and this one lady looks at me and just shakes her head. 
points me in one direction. Another man literally pulls his blind down. <laughs> and a third guy pops into a window, and his name is Dwayne. And he says, I got gotcha. you. I'll come down to my window. I'll help you. So he takes my passport, starts kind of muttering. This is more than six months old. I don't know if this is possible. Um, not saying much, just he goes, go downstairs, get a photo, we'll see what we can do. Um, at this point, I'm thinking, at best, I might get one of those 48-hour rest jobs, which would put me, which would get to me on Saturday, maybe I'd get to Costa Rica by Sunday or Monday. And um, I go downstairs, get a new picture, and his colleague, Robert, comes running down and says, you don't need a new picture, I think Dwayne figured it out. So I run back up. By this time, there's six guards flanking the door, and they're, they're shut down. I mean, they're like, we're not letting anybody else in. But Robert says, she's with me. And I go over to Dwayne's window. He's snipping a photo. He's pat he goes, all right, just have a seat. And he passes my passport, passport down a couple windows to Marquita, who goes to work on it. I'm, I sit there for about 20 minutes, and Marquita calls me up, Holly, Holly Hudley? And, uh, she hands me a brand new passport. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, so any time that we think that our government agencies don't work, they actually can. And this one happened within 30 minutes, which was incredible. I've never experienced that. <laughs> you said you had once. Um, so she hands me a new passport. I'm like tears. I go, can I just give you a hug? And she's like, you can't do that in the government agency. <laughs> <laughs> and there's glass separating us. So I put my face up to the glass, and I'm just like, I love you. Thank you. And, um, and, and by this time, it's too late for me to get on the flight that my family is on. But I text Josh at the last minute. I think I'm going to be able to get there by tomorrow or Saturday. I start Googling flights. Um, Sayla's sitting next to me Googling flights. And I decide, you know, I'm just going to try calling a, a, an airline, which, again, nobody ever picks up when you call those numbers, right? So I call Southwest, and Jennifer answers on the third ring. And um, I just say, Jennifer, do you think you can get me on a flight to Costa Rica within 24 hours to join my family? And she's like, let me see what we got, baby. And um, <laughs> I, I got called baby by a lot of very sweet women that day. <laughs> And um, she says, you know, it's 3.45 by this point. She says, I have one seat left on a 5.45. Can you get here? And I said, yes. <laughs> um, and so she says, I can't, I can't, am I squeaking? No. She, she says, I can't reserve it. I mean, I can't check you in. I can just reserve it. OK. Do, can you get here as quickly as possible? And I'm, again, like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Can we make one of those adorable Southwest Airlines commercials because everybody loves Southwest Airlines, and I love you, thank you. So I hang up with Jennifer and call another Uber. This is Lienis. She picks me up and negotiates, like, standstill, knock-off traffic to Hobby and gets me there within 20 minutes. She took back roads, and anyway, she gets me there. And I arrive at Hobby, I check in. Uh, my flight is at 5.45. The reason she was able to get me on it was because it was delayed from 5.10. And you know, so that gave her enough time to reserve the seat. Um, I get there, I have like an hour and 20 minutes to drink a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple tacos, just one. That was all I needed. Um, so this idea that, um, you know, I didn't, I'm not special in any way. I didn't even pray. As I said, I like swore. And, um, <laughs> and this all worked out. And it, it isn't because I am better than or more connected or had the right words to say. It is just the universe kind of said yes. You know, all these moments kind of said, yes. And I went, I'm going to step into that. I'm just going to step into that and see what happens. Um, so my name for God, Carlos, Sela, Dwayne, Robert, Marquita, Jennifer, Leonis. It's a lot to pray, um, but it works. And, you know, this whole event got me thinking that a Buddhist might call this karma, right? A Christian calls it grace. Uh, an atheist calls it chance. Um, Rene Descartes would say this is the mechanistic way of the universe. It just works this way. 
And whatever it is, the truth is it just works this way. Um, and it kind of says to me that things bend towards connection. And connection is the way of life. And whatever it is, it's there. It's in between us. It's among us. It's like dark matter to me, which is what keeps us from flying apart. It's our interstitial space, which keeps us from flying apart. So we, the larger I kind of envision this, you know, it's said that we live and move and have our beings in God. This is just what is. And the more that that, the more abstract that idea, the, actually the more concrete God becomes to me. That I think of this miraculous event that happened. It was a set of everyday occurrences. No Jesus on the toast. No, no otherworldly phenomenon. It just came together. And um, I'll just read this, but the, the, the idea that God is shapeless, but also contained in forms, so in forms of you, like you and me, that God is both infinitesimal and infinite, um, that God is not you, but as Bill reminds us, not other than you. These are non-dual ideas that, for me, keep God both simple and complex enough to embrace whatever that mystery is. Um, someone I don't know well but respect from afar pointed me to an interview with a teacher named Jeannie Zandi, and she, she talks about kind of softening our beings to this life force, to this thing that nurtures connection. Does that what I have to say about that? God? We'll do that later. But that's my, that's my, that was my communion. <laughs> 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 Thank you to all the little gods. <laughs> so, uh, uh, speaking of synchronicity, mm -hmm. somebody sent me a quote while we were working on this, this Friday. The miraculous is not extraordinary, but the common mode of existence. It's our daily bread. And this is written by Wendell Berry, okay? Whoever really has considered the lilies of the field or the birds of the air and pondered the improbability of their existence in this warm world within the cold and empty stellar distances will hardly balk at the turning of water into wine, which after all was a very small miracle. We forget the greater and still continuing miracle by which water with soil and sunlight is turned into grapes. Mm -hmm. It's all a miracle. So I was, uh, here's my piece about God. <clears throat> I was teaching in the seminary and at the same time working on my doctoral dissertation when this bombshell of a book was published in 1963. That was 56 years ago, and I am still, um, we are all still chafing under the fact that this sort of information did not make it into the educational curriculum of churches. Bishop Robinson, John A.T. Robinson, was a bishop of Warwich in the Church of England, and the book is called Honest to God. Some of you are old enough to remember the 60s. And um, already we had begun to be taught as seminarians as early as the late 50s because of the work of Paul Tillich not to refer to God as God but to God as the ground of being. Well, John A.D. Robinson came out in this book and suggested that we stop using the word God altogether. Now, you just think, what comes to your mind when you hear the word God? Out there. And I have tried to honor that. I'm not consistent with it. But I have tried to honor that by using the word sacred mystery instead of the word God. We are in sacred mystery. 
And uh, I think the problem with the word God is that it locates God elsewhere. Now, we're going to come back to this in a, in a future time. But I just think now that our current understanding of the cosmos is calling us to rethink all of these categories. God and prayer. And there are a huge number of questions uh, uh, about prayer. Michael Moorwood, whom I discovered over the holidays. Any of you heard of Michael Moorwood? You have? Uh, he's an amazing writer to, uh, in, in the Roman Catholic tradition, although he's been removed from that tradition because he questioned the doctrine of the church. Uh, Michael Moore, Moorwood says that we should use the phrase divine presence, which is close to sacred mystery. And Moorwood says divine presence, always here, always everywhere, active in an expanding universe and in the evolution of life on this planet. Mm -hmm. Ilya Delio calls it entanglement. Entanglement. Yeah. I think she calls it divine entanglement, yeah. doesn't she? So a lot of questions that were brought up with the last time we did this were about prayer. You know, what does it mean? What does prayer mean in light of this kind of expanding notion of God? Um, whatever I say is not to get us out of a spiritual practice. I think ritual, quiet, poetry, contemplation, they all have a deep purpose in our lives. But um, this idea, if, if God's not personified, if God is not a who, um, but just a this, right, all of this, how does prayer work? Um, Bill and I had a conversation, and we were talking about, you know, people make meaning. People, we are meaning makers. We want to know that our words and our lives have purpose. And I can't answer what meaning or prayer looks like for everybody, but I certainly can say this, that what we do matters. And certainly the actions of Carlos, Selah, Dwayne, Robert, Marquita, Jennifer, and Leonis, they all mattered to me. Their actions were just in being. They all said yes to a moment also. It wasn't superhuman. It was not otherworldly. It was just a collection of these ordinary events that had mounted to an extraordinary outcome. Our stance, I think, towards other people, our stance towards life, is a kind of prayer. You know, how do we sort of connect with or interact with everything around us? Are we guided by fear, skepticism, ego, isolation? Or are we led by gratitude, wonder, uh, curiosity, and connection? Of course, sometimes the answer is both, right? Um, but to me, how I engage with that is prayer. How I kind of embrace that is prayer. Bill framed it to me the other way, or the other day in this way. Is my being being enlarged by what is happening, or is it reducing myself and others? And if we embrace this idea that everything is connected, that embracing life and love is the primary way we can live and move and have our being in God or the cosmos, then how we do that increases that connection. Thich Nhat Hanh's prayer before eating is, look at the sun, at the farmer, at the rain, at everything that had to be possible to make this meal. In this food, I see clearly the entire universe supporting my existence. And the thing is that it's, it's supporting all of ours. So um, I, I, I pray. I pray for people by name. Um, I do that because people have asked me to, and that's a way of honoring their request. I don't think it works any magic. I think of prayer, my, my daily practice of prayer, some of which is I read. I read um, John, Ka uh, not, uh, John Cabot Zinn's um, Neil Douglas Klotz, I'm sorry, I read his um, translation of the Lord's Prayer every day. I read the St. Francis Prayer every day. Um, I think of prayer as a way of nurturing a relationship. You know, the only way that 
my wife knows that I love her is for me to tell her. Mm -hmm. I have to say the words. And um, I don't think that there is an external theistic source out there that I am obligated to snivel in front of. <laughs> But I do think that if that the sacred mystery that's around us, that there is a way to nurture that relationship and to pay attention to to all of it. Mm -hmm. Stepping into the river of yes. Yes. Okay, minor topic. <laughs> Politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, let's go on to another one. Uh, <laughs> um, when these questions came up and the comments came up, I thought about the fact that this Christmas Eve, uh, we had five services here at St. Paul's Christmas Eve, and uh, it takes a lot to get baby Jesus born. Uh, go there. You are so I have been I have been at St. Paul's for 30 years. We had more people in attendance at the Christmas Eve services this year than ever in the history of the church. The four o'clock service, the um, cathedral space was packed. The chapel space was packed. They had created another worship space downstairs on the first floor in front of the where the choir robes, outfitted it with an altar and Advent candles, and that packed. People started going to the youth center, or they went away. And one of the people who was an usher in that space, I kept saying, we're running out of orders of service. We don't have places to put people anymore. What are we going to do? And she said, well, we'll just shuffle them down here to the youth center. Never have I seen the attendance like that. Mm -hmm. And she said, this is a 9-11 effect. What do you mean? She said, do you remember how the church was packed after 9-11? That's the way people in our culture right now are feeling about what's going on in this country. And they turn to religion. They turn to, to God during this time. I never thought about it in, in that particular way. Can you read the caption of this cartoon? I sure can. Say what you will about 2018. I haven't been kept awake at night by the same fear once. <laughs> that about sums it up. <laughs> so I'm going to say this about, um, about that. Jesus, and we are going to continue to wrap our lives around the teaching of Jesus and Jesus and the questions that Jesus uh, asked. Jesus was a very political animal. It was not for saying, look at the lilies of the field, that they killed him. It was for his going to the power structure of the day and said to saying, in effect, to Caesar, you are not God. God is God. And the power structure didn't like that. And that's the reason that Jesus was executed. Um, so briefly, during the time of Constantine, what was at that time the Jesus movement was co-opted by the government, declared to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. When that happened, the diversity that was in the movement went away. Uniformity came about. Uh, the powerful group in Rome, there were other groups in other places, but the powerful group in Rome prevailed. That's why it was called the Roman Catholic Church after that thing. Humans were just as political then as we are now. There, that we cannot have a naive view of how all of this came about. But it was with Constantine that there came a shift in the Jesus movement, in the, in the organized religious movement. The shift occurred on getting it right rather than how to follow Jesus. 
The shift was on, we've got this doctrine that you must agree to, rather than what does it mean to feed the poor, to visit the sick, to deal with those who are in prison, to actually bring healing to the lives of people. And um, so over a long period of time, the emphasis has been in, in organized religion, an emphasis on creeds and doctrines and belonging and getting it right. I'm going to talk about sin next Sunday. So you start thinking about what you think sin is. <laughs> And go get as much of it out of the way as you can. There'll be an opportunity for, for confessions afterward. Is that the idea? <laughs> so today, what we see in our government um, are absolute unashamed racism, classism, sexism at the highest levels of, of our government. And when I read what is coming out of the mouths of people who are using God or religion to justify prevailing American politics, it is clear that religion has never really touched them or healed them at the unconscious levels that allow them to have a way to express their own hurts, their own fears, their own angers onto the other, whoever that, that other is. And um, this is why some can call this a Christian nation, in spite of our consumer-oriented, proud, warlike, racist, class-conscious, addictive culture. We have, as a culture, our spiritual work cut out for us. Now, I'm about to really personify the sacred. God is not partisan. If I could roll the clock back to as little as six years ago, maybe four, and I could say to one of the evangelical leaders who are so vocal today, if I could say, you know, in six years you will support from your pulpits a thrice-married uh, thrice liar who brags about sexual assault, that would give them a heart attack. Evangelical used to be the voice of morality. Do you remember the moral majority? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that word is, have anybody who declares himself moral is immoral to start with. I don't know, many of you ask, how can we speak to each other across such a divide that exists in American politics? I don't know how to answer that question respectfully. We have to learn to speak to each other with respect. Um, but when somebody deeply believes that God is an external white guy in the sky who is controlling things, that God is on our side, it's hard to uh, get an argument going or a discussion going. Mm -hmm. Nicholas Kristof had an article in the New York Times in 2017 that I saved. He has an imaginary conversation between God and Jimmy Baker. You remember Jim Baker? <laughs> he was imprisoned on fraud and, and um, uh, rape allegations. He's back on the air today, preaching the same stuff he was preaching then. And selling survival, and selling survival buckets for the second coming? Wow. How much are they? <laughs> Ninety dollars for twenty. Ninety dollars for twenty wow. for mac and cheese that will last how long? Twenty years. Twenty years. And it comes in a, like, you know, a five-gallon box. But we need clean water to make mac and cheese, so I'm not sure if it'll work. Oh, it's ready to go. Ooh. Ready to go. Open that can. Not even peanut butter, huh? Now, I'm going to read the exchange between God and Jimmy Baker. I just want you to notice your own internal reactions when you hear what God says to Jimmy Baker. Baker says to God, God, will you send your flesh and blood again on earth so we can exalt him? God says, him, it's a her. She's a 16-year-old Syrian Muslim girl in Arkansas. 
But ICE just arrested her and deported her to a refugee camp in Turkey. Hmm. How many of you saw the PBS series uh, with Ken Burns on Vietnam? Okay. If we could get that 50-year perspective on now, you know, you can look back and see it in, in, in the Vietnam thing how we were lied to, Republicans and Democrats, the whole system, and how much it cost, how many people died mm -hmm. because we needed to make somebody other. One of my best friends who died a couple of years ago and was a military career officer <clears throat> argued with me to the, almost the day he died that if we'd just been allowed to stay in Vietnam, we could have won. Hmm still be there. So here's what I believe. Um, oh, I was going to say something about <laughs> fake news, but I actually took this I took this photograph in Turkey, a genuine fake watch. <laughs> I have one. It's a Rolex. <laughs> I do. It's a Rolex. I paid fifteen dollars for it. Uh, it's, it's, but it's, it's genuine. It's, it's genuine, genuine fake. fake. Yeah. And it, actually, it keeps better time than many of the watches um, I have. Yeah, so glad. Yeah. Here's what I believe: our basic human problem is resolved in the diversity that is sacred mystery. But we won't see or experience that if we don't allow ourselves to live and move within that mystery and at the same time find that mystery expressed through how we live and move. Mm -hmm. That's what I yeah. believe. I'm done. Okay. Yeah, this, uh, in, in my experience, God was uh, Mexican, black, Cuban, Venezuelan, white. God is sacred mysteries, all of it. Mm -hmm. um, so. We had some questions also. I do my spiritual practice. I participate in this. I try to be a good person. They're still suffering. Um, I, we still suffer. So why, if we do this, is suffering a fact of life? I don't know. But it is also a law of the universe, right? We have chaos and destruction as well as creativity and rebirth. And it feels unfair when it happens to us, and it definitely feels like relief when it doesn't. Um, and if any of you read The Road Less Traveled, I think that came out in the 90s, um, it starts out by saying life is difficult. This is a great truth and one of the greatest truths. Once we can accept that, then we can sink into it. To return for a second to the teacher I mentioned earlier, Je Jeannie Zandi, she talks about really sinking into the experience of our grief not just personal grief, but also that collective grief, and suffering in order to open up what is recreated from that. So to avoid sinking into grief is actually what causes more pain. Grief can be creative, life-giving, and even a loving force if we invite a sort of rebirth from it. She expands on this process, and I recommend checking this video out. Maybe we can link to it in an interview on YouTube called Embodying Yin. Inviting the light into the dark spaces restores the dark to its nature in light. Um, I shared before that story of tikkun olam where we're all born from shards of light. And that is our destiny, to kind of be in the light. Um, right in there, in the, inside of the grief, there's a sweet spot where love can lead us and healing can be both fierce and also soft. For me, tending to grief is also an act of prayer. Um, it, can, it can bring a lot out. In a book called The Wild Edge of Sorrow, Francis Wells said that there is some strange intimacy between grief and aliveness, some sacred exchange between what seems unbearable and what is most exquisitely alive. Grief is truly an emotion that arises from the soul. I've learned to go inside and kind of retrieve both the little and big girl parts of me that have suffered, that have hurt and remother them, if you will. And I always imagine myself kind of my elderly grandmother self just going, it's okay, baby. <laughs> That's become my kind of way mm. of dealing with the grief within. So. Mm. so Jesus is very interested in people who suffer. 
And just to anticipate a little bit about what, these are not my notes, okay. uh, what next Sunday is going to be about. What did Jesus think was sin? Ignorance. <laughs> not being aware. Not seeing. Not hearing. In Buddhism, you don't have a category of sin. But you do have the big beginning point of ignorance. And Buddhism starts with life is suffering. Now we have to develop our response to that. And Buddha did that by developing the Eightfold Path. And Jesus did that by teaching things like the Beatitudes. So it's a, it's a way, not a, not a belief. There's a way to live. And it may come as a, as a surprise to you, but you're not going to make it out of here. <laughs> well, you might not. Yeah. You might not. I mean, statistics are such that probably in the next six months, one of you is going to die. 100% of us will die. Well, 100% of us will. Mm -hmm. Okay, have a nice right. day. Have <laughs> a nice day. See y'all. All right. We love you. <laughs> okay, well, here's one of my favorite exchanges from the work of Carl Jung. Carl Jung was asked, will we make it? And Jung said, if enough of us do our own work. Now, um, do I have time to do this? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll do this real quickly. I've said this before, and, and, but I just want to say it again. Very little of us is conscious. Most of us is unconscious. Most of who we are is unconscious. And we as a culture, we as a world are in the grips of four unconscious shadow aspects that are running and ruining our country and our world. Now, you know, in the Western world, in the entire Western world, there's a move to the right. There's a move to the right for more security and more purity of race or ideology or whatever it is. These are the four archetypes that we are run by. One is the archetype of, of, of patriarchy. White men run the show. Mm -hmm. There is a growing movement of white supremacy all over the Western world. And uh, this affects us. This affects all of us because it's in the culture. It's in what we breathe. The notion of white supremacy affects our understanding of God. Mm -hmm. The second one is a flawed creation. There's something wrong with you. This is, as, as a therapist, I can tell you over the long history of my work, that, that's one of the most common themes that people say to me. If you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, if I really knew you, I'd love you even more. But I really want to know you. That's first. The third one is the need to be de dependent. If you want to be safe, if you want to be saved, you've got to learn to play by the rules and belong to the right group and all wrapped up in this somehow is the notion that God has got to be compensated in order for us to be okay. Mm -hmm. Jesus has to die for you to be okay. And perhaps the worst of our collective shadows is the belief in redemptive violence. You know the most violent show on TV? NFL. NFL. That's true. Did you know I was going to answer the question? You said it before. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and you know what Sunday. the you know what the second most violent program on TV is? The news. The ten o'clock news. If you watch it, I don't watch it. So, I want to make a deal with you, with every person seated here. Okay. I'm dead serious about this. I'm going to make a deal with you. I want you today to go home. You have got access to Amazon. And either order for your e-reader or order a hard copy of this book, Living and Examine Life by Jim Hollis. 
I have read most, I, I can't say everything. I, I, I know there are a couple of monographs that Jim Hollis wrote that I've not read, but I've read everything Jim Hollis wrote. And if you've read anything Jim Hollis has written and you read this book, you're not going to be reading anything new. But I want to make you a deal. Buy this book and read it. Every chapter can be read in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Read a chapter a day. Don't make any notes about it. Just read every day. Read a chapter. And when you finish the book, start it over, this time making notes. Mm -hmm. Every, just read a chapter and make notes. Where is this applicable to me? Now, by this time, you will have found somebody to be your reading partner. It could be your spouse. It could be your therapist, your spiritual director, a, a neighbor, somebody sitting here in this class. But you have somebody that you can talk about, to, uh, to, about this book to. Jim Hollis, Leading the Examine Life. And then when you finish reading it the second time, put it down and start reading it again. Now, my <laughs> reading partner for this is Matt Russell. And I don't know if you all know Matt uh, or well or not, but um, working with Matt is like working with popcorn. <laughs> He's just all over the place. I love Matt. I just love Matt. And, 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 and um, so we read and we talk about this book. And um, what changes it's, it's making for us in this. And how it affects our religious and spiritual life. How it, how it affects our work here. Uh, I cannot remember who said the unexamined life is not worth living. Who? Walter. Walter? Walter? Hmm. Okay. And Eli Stevenson also once said, after he gave a speech, uh, he said to, that somebody came up to him and said, uh, Senator Stevenson, you're going to have the vote of every thinking person in this country. <laughs> and Stevenson said, I need more than that. Yeah. So 20 people voted for him, right? <laughs> yeah. One of the real functions of authentic religion is to give people an inner life. Not something to believe, not something to belong to, but an inner life. And to the degree that uh, religion doesn't do this, it failed. And I don't mean to sound arrogant, but I've just offered you a way to enrich your inner life. To read this book and, and begin to take it in and to absorb it. There are other ways that you can have a spiritual practice, but... Um, I think this is, um, this is the wisdom of Jesus. I want to read you a passage from this book, and then uh, i got to go back to work. <laughs> By the way, Tommy's sermon today is one of the best he's ever done, I think. And it's related to kind of what we're talking about in here, mm -hmm. I think. This is, this is Jim Hollis. Those who want the good old days, who want their country back, are really wishing that their once privileged position be ratified and reified and that the anxiety of ambiguity be treated with the medicine of certainty, received authority, and traditional values. What is not addressed, indeed, what is most exploited in every country, every culture, every religious or political hegemony under the own slot of change is how much of the blowback is fueled by psychopathology. So I think one of the things that we can offer to each other and that we can offer to the world is an examined life. Mm -hmm. And that's a way that we can make a difference. So, tell you our day short end. Can uh -huh. I read this? Yes. I just, this is a prayer. Yeah. I think it could be a poem. <laughs> Um, you know, Chardin was um, kept from teaching in the church because mm -hmm. of his doctrines, at least until after he died. Mm -hmm. I'm getting to do this before I die. That's right. It's yeah. Great. <laughs> You're making sure all of us are going down with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a comforting thought. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Blessed are you, harsh matter, barren soil, stubborn rock. You who yield only to violence, you who force us to work if we would eat. 
Blessed be you, perilous matter, violent sea, untamable passion, you who, unless we fetter you, will devour us. Blessed be you, mighty matter, irresistible march of evolution, reality ever born, ever new, you who, by constantly shattering our mental categories, force us to go even further and further in our pursuit of the truth. Blessed be you, universal matter, unmeasurable time, boundless ether, triple abyss of stars and atoms and generations, you who, by overflowing and dissolving our narrow standards of measurement, reveal to us the dimensions of God. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. No matter <laughs> where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step. I'll see you here next week, and we'll talk about sin. <laughs> I'm glad you're leading that one.